Hi folks, Dan from DNN Custom Creations. Uh, apologize, it's been a long time since we've made a video. Uh, been some things going on, took a little precedence, but uh, let's get a video started. Uh, what I wanna do today is uh, talk to you a little bit about how I've gone from uh, creating the, uh, cutting out the items, <clears throat> removing the dross. I have a little video to show you how I remove the dross. I don't have one of them fancy machines where you stick it in there and there's a big belt sander and takes that all off for you. It's a manual process, uh, but uh, we get it done. I, I want to show you the powder coat booth that I've created, uh, the powder coat system and how I'm doing powder coat with just a cheap uh, um, Eastwood gun. Uh, and then I bought an oven. I bought an, a real powder coat oven and made a rack to hang things on. I'll show you some of the uh, parts of that. But the first thing I want to do is show you what the base of the powder coat booth, uh, how it started, just with a cheap, uh, basically a shelf. I think I got it from Walmart, might have been Sam's, but uh, uh, we'll show you. This is a little short clip. I'm going to show you how to remove the dross. Uh, you've seen it before probably, and it's similar to what other people have used done. Here's a little dragonfly. You see the backside dross on this dragonfly. Um, front side it doesn't look too bad. But um, so I use a, uh, a twisted wire uh, cup on uh, a small little four inch grinder. Uh, and then for anything that doesn't uh, get removed using that wire brush, then I go to a flat wheel uh, disc. So uh, notice I'm putting on a face shield. There's a, not only does a dross go flying, and, uh, but little pieces of wire brush come off and can be real hazardous. So make sure you got some good eye protection. The, uh, the wire brush takes majority of it off. There are some that are left uh, that I then have to go back with the flap wheel. But I would say 90 to 95% of it comes off that wire brush. <clears throat> there is uh, some areas that you gotta be kind of careful. You'll see on the dragonfly, the little antenna and some legs in the back that uh, uh, are, there's not much meat there. And so that brush, if you're not careful, can dig in and bend those up. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it, the wire brush does a pretty good job. And uh, you'll see here, uh, when they uh, bring it up close to the camera, you'll see what's left and uh, how much of it then I have to go back with the, with the flap wheel. So you can see there's a couple little spots. I think I'll point them out here in just a second um, that the uh, the wire brush didn't quite uh, take off. You could probably use a little uh, you know chisel or something else and get them off, but uh, I just elect to go with a, a flap wheel. I do do both sides, and the reason I do that, uh, even on the front side where it doesn't have dross and that sort of thing, I, I try and round the edges uh, just a little bit, just take the real sharp off, because uh, when I found that when I'm powder coating, any, where there's a real sharp edge, a lot of times that powder will kind of pull away from that edge, and so you don't get good uh, powder coat coverage on that. So I do... I, uh, both sides with the with both the wire brush and the flap wheel again to try and remove some of that uh, sharpness on the edge. There it is, nothing uh, special, no magic. And if this was, uh, you already knew all about this. Uh, apologize. Hope you might have skipped forward to the next section. Okay, the uh, the powder coat booth actually started with one of these cheap shelf and just basically the frame. These are those cheap shelves where you got particle board that uh, goes on each shelf and uh, uh, they're, they're really cheap. These things, they come apart. You can see they just, you know, uh, uh, come apart. And so that's what I started with. Uh, we'll take it inside now and uh, show you what we wound up with. Okay, here is the uh, powder coat booth created from that shelf unit. And you, the first thing you notice is that there are no support members that are crossing on the front. Well, obviously that would make it uh, pretty flimsy uh, until you actually put wood around it. So when you, re when you uh, surround it uh, with a wood frame, then it becomes basically self-supporting. Uh, supporting. So I'm going to walk you around a little bit and just show you 
uh, just a piece of, of uh, chipboard plywood uh, around the sides, uh, one for the floor, and obviously in, in the back. Up at the top, I had some white paneling that I used. I wanted it to see if it might help reflect the light. So uh, I managed to get that in there. Uh, the rest of it is pretty much plywood. Uh, I'm first, I'm going to show you the lighting. And creates pretty good light. These are uh, LEDs, uh, so they help show up any uh, part on the whatever your powder coating that doesn't have a, a good coverage. And these lights, these LED lights, I don't know if you've seen, gosh, you see them on Facebook, you see them all over the place now. These, uh, they look like a fan blade, and you screw it into a, a light socket. Uh, you know, like for your garage or so forth, and it, it provides you a LED light. Well, that basically, I took one of those and took the three blades, if you want to call them that, uh, took them loose from that and uh, rewired them uh, out to a little box. And inside the box is just the control unit for that with an on-off switch. <clears throat> so... Uh, it, it seems to work pretty good. I still use a, a bright LED flashlight to verify that I've got in all the nooks and crannies, but it works pretty good. All right, let's talk about the filter system. Uh, as you can see, just a single panel. This is not one of those fancy filters that you, you know, really are designed for powder coating and take the, you know, the real small particles out of the air. It, a lot of it gets through this thing, um, but uh, it's easy to change. I just uh, flip this up and pull that out, and then you see behind is the uh, the opening where the uh, powder goes. And I'll show you uh, how that works and how I create a, a vacuum in that location in order to draw uh, the powder out. A lot of the powder uh, sticks to the walls and obviously lands on the floor or sticks to that back panel. But but the filter does get dark if I've been if I powder coat a bit, uh, so I know it's working. Uh, so let's take you around to the back side, and it's just a, a plenum that uh, I made, uh, and you see at the bottom I've uh, integrated a vacuum. Uh, system for a, a shop vac. Now let me point out right away that if you're going to use a shop vac with powder, you got to make sure that the bag that's in that shop vac is the kind that's designed uh, for uh, like sheetrock dust and concrete dust will take out all of the small particles because this powder uh, is basically flammable in a, and then you hear about people with dust explosions in silos and that sort of thing. That's the kind of thing that can happen uh, if you don't have the right bag in your shop bag. Uh, but basically what I do is just simply hook that up and uh, start it. And I have, uh, uh, obviously a lot of that stuff gets collected on the filter, so I know I'm creating a decent vacuum. Uh, and then I have checked the inside of the shop back afterwards, there is no indication of powder. And I, I, I shoot exclusively black for what I'm doing, so it would show up pretty easy. Uh, and so I know that that filter bag is doing what it should be doing. Okay, uh, the key part of this is the, uh, the gun and, and that sort of thing. Again, this is just a cheap Eastwood. It's a single voltage gun. It's not even the good uh, dual voltage gun. I'm not an expert, but on what I understand, the uh, dual voltage gun is, is better if you're uh, doing a second coat. And unless I screw something up, I hope that I don't have to do a lot of second coats on these uh, signs and things that I'm making. It, uh, I've made some mods to this gun, um, probably a little risky. And so if you're going to attempt to do this, uh, I caution you to, to tread uh, lightly. But I got tired of having to carry the box and the wiring all connected to the gun outside every time I wanted to clean the gun. So I cut the high voltage lead and put a connector in. Now, let me tell you that these connectors, you know, they come in all kinds of configurations and I probably should have used one with four, 
but you need to separate the two leads, the ground and the high voltage lead from each other. If it was, if it was in a, that was two, the two closest together, it'll arc, it'll arc all day long. Uh, I mean, it's like a spark plug, uh, basically. And so by separating it between the two, I've eliminated that, but you know, to be safe, I probably should have gone with a four and put them on the two outside legs. But that allows me then to uh, take the gun and you know, go outside, clean up, blow it off like you uh, need to do if you're gonna change color and so forth. The powder coat gun runs at a pretty low voltage, not voltage, uh, runs at a pretty low pressure. And so you need a good pressure gauge that's going to be accurate at low pressure. Well, I found that uh, one of these that's basically made for a propane tank system, uh, which is zero to 30 PSI, allows me real accurate control to get this gun where I need it, which is typically between eight and 10 PSI, depending on uh, what color I'm shooting, etc. cetera. Uh, then I also have a, an air nozzle hooked up to it because just before you spray, I like to clean off uh, any of the dust uh, because uh, if you leave the dust on there, it'll leave a little bit of a defect or you know, you'll see it uh, when the powder coat is done. Here's the gun. This is a safety switch you got to hold on while you're spraying. I thought about mounting a switch to the trigger assembly so every time you pulled the trigger, it activated it and turned it on, but uh, I haven't done that yet. <clears throat> I painted uh, the inside of this again, except for that white panel, which is kind of a Formica material or something. But I painted it all inside with enough coats so that it's fairly slick, so the powder is easy uh, to wipe off and, and undo. Now, those of you who do powder coating know that the ground is important. And I don't have a ground like uh, some of these professionals talk about where you've buried a six foot length copper rod in the ground and, and uh, use that. I'm using the one that goes through the outlet. So it's not the best, but it's the ground that comes with, with the box. And inside, I have a threaded rod that I've basically made into a, uh, a grid and the threaded rod is tied together. And then I just connect the ground to the outside here. So that entire grid system is uh, grounded inside. So wherever I hang the part off of the metal hooks and so forth, uh, it maintains a ground. And here are the rotation. I got a bunch of hooks back here uh, <clears throat> that I use. And if it's light stuff, I just use um, um, safety wire some stainless safety wire because I can throw it away. I don't have to worry about cleaning the powder coat that's hardened and been cooked on off of it because if you leave it on there, then you're not going to get a good ground. Uh, got wheels on the bottom. Good old Harbor Freight wheels allows you to move the thing around easily. And you can tell <laughs> it has become a nice shelf to carry extra junk. Uh, so that is the booth. I'm um, pretty happy with it so far. Uh, now what I do is after I powder coat and that, that filter will become pretty black, I'll take and undo the, the vacuum cleaner from the back and I'll come around the front and I'll just you know go over the front of that thing and suck a lot of the uh, powder out of that, trying to you know keep that filter uh, usable for a ext more extended period of time. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about the um, powder coat oven and the rack that I made. Uh, by the way, here's a couple of the things that I just recently took out. Um, and that is coated in uh, semi-gloss black. Here's a sign. I, those are about, I think that they, the, uh, the temperature sign that you use for how you cook your meat and so forth, I think that's 21 inches tall. This uh, welcome to our porch thing, I think that's uh, 18 inches in diameter. And there's a little dragonfly garden stake. But anyways, this is the rack system that I built. And you gotta make sure that you use metal wheels cause it's gonna go into an oven that's about 400, between 400 and 450 degrees. So, you know, plastic wheels are gonna melt. So if you make something like this and you wanna roll it in and out, uh, make sure that you use wheels that are gonna survive that kind of temperature. Okay, powder coat oven. I didn't make this. Uh, I thought about making it, but you know, there was so much going on, I just decided to bite the bullet and, 
and uh, buy one. So this is, uh, let's see, five feet high uh, and then uh, four feet in uh, width and depth. And you can see it's at ground level, so this cart just basically slides in when, uh, when it comes time, which makes it really nice. So I slide that in and, uh, and it's good to go. You can see the two oven elements on the side. Uh, that's what heats it up. There's the uh, thermocouple to give the temperature. It does have an oven in the back that uh, opening back there uh, allows you to do sort of a kind of think of it a convection oven thing to uh, get move the hot air around. <clears throat> Here's a control. It's just basically no timer, none of that kind of thing on it, just a digital uh, temperature control. I've mounted a little muffin fan on the heat sink uh, because it's in an area that doesn't get a lot of air. And uh, I've run it now a number of times and that heat sink stays nice and cool, so I'm good. There's the fan in the back with the switch to turn it on and off. Just two uh, simple door latches and uh, it uh, does everything I've asked of it so far. I, um, I typically will get it up to about 450. Most of the stuff, again, I shoot black. I get it to 450, I throw it in there, and after, oh, four or five minutes, three or four minutes, I'll open the door and peek in, and if the item that I'm uh, trying to powder coat has turned a little glossy, then I reduce the temperature to 400 and leave it in there for 20 minutes. And that seems to have uh, done the job. So that is the powder coat system. Uh, you know, I was paying uh, to have some the stuff powder coated and the guy did a great job and I, I didn't want to take business away from him. But, you know, sometimes I'd take it and it'd be a week before I'd get it back. And sometimes I need to turn some things around faster than that. And uh, so I, I went ahead and, and bought this. He was charging me about five bucks a piece for the things that I was making, which is probably a great deal. Uh, I don't know. There's not a lot of powder coaters in this area. So a couple of little things to show you kind of the status of what's been going on. Uh, here's some, I guess I'll get the camera tripod out of the way. Here's some, there's a hall table uh, that I made. I make the base and uh, wood and I don't get along. So if somebody else puts the wood on, uh, here's a little coffee table that again, I made the base that, that one was powder coated. That was powder coated by that guy that has been doing it for me. And just as further proof that I, uh, wood and I are not friends. I don't even know what kind of wood that is. It's beautiful. Uh, but uh, um, the guy that, uh, put that on there, uh, you know, did a great job. Use those little bow tie things uh, to make sure that the splits in the wood didn't uh, propagate. But, uh, and then uh, this one is uh, patinaed. Uh, it's uh, rusted using muriatic acid and some, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember what, I, oh, hydrogen peroxide to speed the process up. And then I, uh, a, coated it just with a couple little spots of blue because someone liked blue. And so that's where that came from. So we got that done. Um, what I wanna do in here in a little bit is uh, I'm gonna actually powder coat a couple little things. I'll, uh, I'll let you see that process. I might make that a different video so that you don't have to watch it all, but I'll show you the, the process and how the gun works and, and then, uh, you know, how the oven works, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, do that, uh, might do that in a, in a video upcoming, or I might, if I get it done today, I might attach it to this video and, and uh, send it out. So the other thing I wanna do is in an upcoming video, I'm gonna give you kind of a shop tour because you know I've basically been showing you the metal side of what I do, but I have not shown you anything about uh, the glass side um, that's basically what my wife does. And I wanna, we're gonna try and turn this side into dual, you know, there'll be a metal and glass because if you see our logo, it's custom creations, metal and glass. And so we wanted to show you the metal side and the glass side. And uh, that'll be in an upcoming video. So I think I've spent my nickel. 
uh, if you watch this, I appreciate you spending 15 minutes of your time or 20 minutes of your time. But uh, that's it so far. Again, apologize for uh, not having videos consistently. I'm going to try and get back on track. Okay, thanks.